The issue of trade has been a big part of our uh, discussion so far. When we think of trade, we typically think of uh, physical or material goods, uh, such as clothing or cars, but property can also be immaterial. That is, we have a property in our ideas or intellectual property. So if we design a new piece of clothing or we design an, a new car, we own those ideas uh, that gave rise to the goods. Uh, James Madison had these two kinds of property in mind, the material and the immaterial, when he wrote his 1792 essay on property. Uh, Madison there was discussing the individual's inalienable ownership of his own uh, natural rights uh, with which we are, of course, all endowed by our creator, including the right to use our minds and have opinions and direct our own free will. Uh, we might call it our, our first or foundational uh, intellectual property. Well, the theme for our lunch talk today is the theft of U.S. intellectual property. Uh, the issue remains one of abiding political importance. In August of this year, President Trump issued an executive memorandum related to China and the theft of intellectual property. Uh, well, to help us think through this vital topic, we are fortunate to have with us the acting chairman of the uh, Federal Trade Commission. She has uh, many years of experience working at the FTC and has served as a commissioner since 2012. A lawyer by training, she has previously been a partner at Wilkinson, Barker, and Knauer, uh, where she focused on trade issues, and she has clerked for Judge David B. Centel at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Uh, she's the author of a, of a variety of articles on competition law, privacy, and technology matters. And uh, she graduated with distinction from the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University, uh, where she was also a professor and uh, also graduated with honors from the University of Virginia. So if you would join me in welcoming to the podium uh, Maureen Olhausen. Thank you. Get my papers arranged here. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and many thanks to Hill Hillsdale College and the Free Market Forum for hosting this important conference. I very much enjoyed the discussions last night and this morning, and I'm pleased to join you today to talk about the importance of intellectual property rights in the U.S. So, uh, as Tim mentioned, I'm going to talk about um, the theft of U.S. intellectual property, but, I, but, I, but I'll put a little spin on it, which is why should we care? Why should we care about the theft of U.S. intellectual property? And at the risk of giving away the punchline to my speech, I've entitled it Strong Patent Rights, Strong Economy. And so I'll talk to you today about the importance of strong patent rights to the U.S. economy and what uh, I can do as the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission to encourage respect for these important rights around the world. But first, a few foundational points. Now, America's founders understood the importance of protecting property, including intellectual property. The Constitution wisely provides that Congress shall have power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which handles patent matters in the U.S., observed that if one were to eliminate the right to exclude from the basket of rights attached to patents, the express purpose of the Constitution and Congress to promote the progress of useful arts would be seriously undermined. Now, note the inclusion of useful arts among the drafters' goals. Their intent was clearly to entice inventors with the lure of exclusive rights. The Supreme Court recognized the important role of this system to provide an incentive to innovators, excuse me, to inventors, to risk the often enormous costs in, in terms of time, research, and development. The productive effort thereby fostered will have a positive effect on society through the introduction of new products and processes of manufacture into the economy. In exchange for this reward for inventions, the patent laws require the inventor to disclose his or her idea so that after the period of exclusivity expires, the public benefits from knowing about 
the public can benefit from knowing about and using that invention freely. The founders knew then what some seem to be overlooking today. Strong intellectual property rights promote a vibrant economy by encouraging innovation. Despite the founders' wisdom and foresight and an over 200-year history during which the United States, driven by technological innovation, emerged as the world's leading economy, a movement is underway to undermine U.S. patent rights. Op-eds call for limiting patent rights. Reputable sources like The Economist magazine voice a, a skeptical tone. Some technology firms claim that patent lawsuits erode their R&D budgets and bottom line. And there have even been calls to abolish the patent system. Now, emerging economies around the world view these statements through their own prisms of history and economic pressure, often citing them as justifications to disregard or diminish prote legal protections for U.S. Propriety, proprietary technologies in their own countries. Few developing com countries combat piracy, for example. Now, some scholars assert that influential jurisdictions appear to use their antitrust powers not to protect competition, but instead to regulate the price of patent rights, and particularly U.S. patent rights. But supporters of inventors' rights shouldn't despair. The United States can continue to lead the way in protecting the rights of deserving inventors and encouraging other countries to do the same. As the acting chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, I have consistently advocated for, strong, for protecting intellectual property rights, both domestically and abroad. Now, two fundamental principles guide my approach. First, strong patent rights are crucial to economic success. And secondly, for all you economists in the audience, economically grounded analysis will reveal the right path through the thicket of IP skepticism. And I look forward to discussing these two principles with you today. So first, the importance of IP rights. Innovation drives the development of new and improved products and services. It meets society's greatest challenges in areas as diverse as energy production, telecommunications, and medical research. But innovation is not easy. It involves a winding road from idea to invention, through development to commercialization. Each of these steps can be risky, expensive, and unpredictable. The goal of the patent system is to promote innovation in light of this risk and uncertainty. It does so by granting patent owners the right to exclude others from making, using, or selling a patented invention for 20 years. Patents create a property right for intangible ideas, which makes licensing them easier and facilitates the sharing of these technological ideas. This property right also protects innovators from copying that could drive down prices and deter future investment. These patent rights have real-world effects. The United States government recently reported that IP-intensive industries support at least 45 million U.S. jobs and contribute more than $6 trillion, or about slightly over 38 percent, of U.S. gross domestic product. Empirical research supports the fundamental role that patent rights play in promoting innovation. And I've written at length, most recently in the Harvard Journal of Law and Technology, about the positive correlation between IP rights and R&D investment in developed countries. So let me give you an idea of some of the research, the evidence that I found. So, for example, scholars who examined data from 60 countries between 1960 and 1990 to explore the relationship between IP rights and economic growth found that intellectual property rights affect economic growth by stimulating the accumulation of factor inputs like research and development capital and physical capital. Other researchers scrutinized data on R&D investment and patent protection from 32 countries between 1981 in 1995. And this evidence unambiguously indicated the significance of intellectual property rights as incentives for spurring innovation. 
and countries which provided stronger protection tended to have larger proportions of their GDP devoted to R&D activities. A host of other empirical work finds a statistically significant relationship between patent strength and R&D investment. A 2013 Brookings report observed, research has established that patents are correlated with economic growth across and within the same country over time. And R&D spending since 1953 is highly correlated with patenting and the patent rate. In studying US data between 1980 and 2010, the report concluded that patenting is associated with higher metropolitan area productivity and that the most likely explanation is that patents cause growth. Now we also know that firms respond to changes in the strength of patent protection. A well-known study, for example, examined the U.S. semiconductor industry between 1979 and 1995. It found that large-scale manufacturers have invested far more aggressively in patents during the periods associated with strong U.S. patent rights, even controlling for other known determinants of patenting. So the solid theoretical and evidentiary justifications for intellectual property rights don't mean that granting ever stronger patent protection will inevitably lead to even greater innovation. And there is a need to scrutinize the quality of patent applications and to calibrate appropriate compensation that should take into account the incentives that drive R&D in various settings. And some limited patent reform may also be appropriate to identify, to address identified problems such as insufficient quality control, the broad scope of certain patent rights, and inadequate disclosure. Nevertheless, strong patent rights should remain at the heart of U.S. industrial policy. So now I'll turn to all this IP skepticism that we're experiencing today. Recent criticism of the patent system requires some explanation. What drives calls to diminish or even eliminate the U.S. patent system? I think several factors are responsible. For example, patenting technologies and commercializing them are increasingly separate acts undertaken by different entities and connected by patent licenses, if at all, after the fact. So someone manufactures a product and then tries to get the license for, for, the, uh, for the patent. Now, one effect of this evolution has been the rise of patent assertion entities known as PAEs. Now, PAEs are businesses that acquire patents from third parties and then try to make money by negotiating with or suing accused infringers. And patent litigation has become more frequent and complex, making enforcing and defending against patent claims expensive. And finally, there's been a trend towards granting broad patents, which the Supreme Court has started to reverse. Now, the implications of all those factors are complicated. But even if today's patent system and associated litigation costs sometimes produce imperfect outcomes, they don't undermine the patent system's core function. Today's patent regime drives a varied, complex, and evolving array of technologies. The markets in which novel products and methods arise are themselves changing. Now, of course, there are imperfections in how patents execute their mission. But some such complications are no reason to abandon the patent system wholesale. Instead, policymakers should take an economically and empirically grounded approach to IP issues. And this view recognizes the many benefits of patent protection while accepting that some revisions may be necessary to promote innovation. So I'll describe two recent FTC initiatives that exemplify my position. In the first, the FTC gathered extensive empirical evidence to support carefully tailored recommendations. And in the second, no evidence supported a substantial change, and I advocated for the retention of traditional intellectual property principles. Now, the first initiative involved patent assertion entities, uh, as I already mentioned, PAEs. And they do not create IP themselves, but, ba but rather buy and license patents to manufacturers and others. And their activities create strong views. Some commentators decry PAEs as high-tech extortionists that tax innovators. 
but others respond that PAEs create patent licensing markets in which individual inventors can monetize their technologies and manufacturers can secure the permissions they need to sell their products lawfully. But claims on both sides, however, have been light on facts and rather heavy on aspersions. And that is why I supported the use of the FTC's research authority to study PAE markets and produce a report which discloses previously unknown facts about how PAEs operate. Now, the report on, um, advances our understanding of PAEs and their role within the patent and innovation system. It was a case study, and it covered PAEs that may account for over 75% of all U.S. patents held by PAEs at the end of 2013. Now, it's full of relevant findings of unavailable in other studies. And while I can't discuss all of them here, after all, this is just a lunch, uh, a few conclusions are worth noting for their contribution to larger policy discussions. For me, the standout conclusion was that there was no single PAE business model. Rather, our research suggested that there were two main types, one of which we called portfolio PAEs and the other we called litigation PAEs. Now, portfolio PAEs appear to be sophisticated firms that aggregate hundreds of or thousands of patents, license their portfolios for millions of dollars apiece, and capitalize themselves through institutional and other investors. And despite making up only 9% of the licenses in the study, they generated four-fifths of the revenue. They hire specialized IP licensing professionals and typically negotiate licenses without first suing their prospective licensees, the manufacturers. So all told, portfolio PAEs engage in conduct that's potentially consistent with an efficient aggregation service, putting together complementary patents and offering an easier licensing regime to people who want to use those, uh, those patents. And given the sums that change hands in arm's length transactions between portfolio PAEs and their licensees, amounts that seem to exceed any litigation costs, it appears that technology users paid sums that reflect or may reflect, reflect the quality of the license patents. So by contrast, litigation PAEs generally sued technology users without first negotiating, and then they would settle shortly thereafter after they filed the lawsuit. And the portfolios that they license often comprise no more than a few patents. And they generated royalties that were typically less than $300,000. And this is an amount that accused infringers could expect to spend through initial discovery in litigation. So it was a, kind of their initial litigation costs. So given the relatively low dollar amount of licenses, the behavior of litigation PAEs was consistent with nuisance litigation. So despite filing 96% of the lawsuits in the study and representing about 91% of licenses, they accounted for only 20% of revenue. Now, to be clear, infringement litigation plays a very important role in protecting patent rights. The ability to sue others for copying your invention is crucial to establishing the property boundaries necessary to promote innovation. But at the same time, nuisance litigation which relies on estimated costs and not the strengths of the patents claimed, can tax judicial resources and divert attention away from productive business behavior. So accordingly, the FTC's report presented tailored recommendations to alleviate potential litigation abuses. For example, it proposes case management practices that could mitigate the litigation cost asymmetries between PAE plaintiffs and defendants. And we also recommended that Congress pass rules increasing transparency and encouraging courts to stay litigation by PAEs against end users. So you've all heard about the, you know, the coffee shop being sued. Uh, but when parallel proceedings are already underway against the manufacturer, the manufacturer of the product that maybe the small business is using. And I've supported these proposals because they're narrowly tailored to address observed behavior without leading to unintended consequences well beyond PAE activity. So the second FTC initiative, where I didn't see evidence to support substantial change, involved the recent revision of our IP licensing guidelines. So in January of this year, the Federal Trade Commission and the U.S. Department of Justice Antitrust Division issued 
jointly issued updated antitrust guidelines for the licensing of intellectual property, which states the agency's enforcement policy with respect to the licensing of IP protected by patent, copyright, and trade secret law. And this is the first update of our guidelines uh, since 1995, and it's occurred you know, after the time where there's been all this criticism and ferment involving for the protection of intellectual property. So although IP licensing is generally pro-competitive, antitrust enforcers do have a role to play in protecting against competitive abuses. Now in the past, I've expressed concern when less like-minded overseas enforcers, often in, in Asia, apply their antitrust laws to dilute US IP rights. And doing so inappropriately morphs antitrust law into a tool for price regulation and creates harmful disincentives for innovation. I'm pleased to say that the 2017 guidelines exemplify my approach to antitrust IP issues and offer reasonable guideposts. More importantly, the new guidelines continue to affirm that IP law grants enforceable rights which have social value. And they also state that antitrust laws generally do not impose liability upon a, fir a firm for unilateral refusal to assist its competitors. So read together with the FTC and DOJ's 20, uh, 2007 IP report, which stated that liability for mere, mere unconditional unilateral refusals to license will not play a meaningful part in the interface between patent rights and antitrust protections, it's clear that the guidelines will continue to protect strong IP rights in the United States. Now, some commentators called upon the US agencies to create new specialized guidelines to address particular types of IP disputes. And I didn't support this because the available evidence did not require major changes to the Commission's approach. And as I've said before, IP issues are not a special case that requires a different competition jurisprudence. For more than 20 years, the guidelines have offered general guidance that has adapted to new and complicated issues in the IP space. And under this precedent, we should be careful not to establish new standards without compelling evidence to do so. So just to conclude, patents have been at the heart of US innovation since the founding of our country. And respect for patent rights is fundamental to advance innovation. The United States is more technologically innovative than any other country in the world. This reality reflects in part the property rights that the US government grants to inventors. Still, some foreign counterparts take or allow the taking of American proprietary technologies without due payment. For example, emerging antitrust regimes view unfairly high royalties as illegal under their antitrust laws. And the FTC's recent policy work that I've just mentioned offers an important counterweight to this approach, illustrating the important role that patents play in promoting innovation and benefiting consumers. In closing, while we may live in an age of patent skepticism, there is hope. Criticism of IP rights frequently does not hold up upon closer examination. Rather, empirical research favors the close tie between strong IP rights and R&D. But this isn't to say that changes to the patent system are always unwarranted. Rather, the key to addressing the US patent system lies in incremental adjustments where necessary based on a firm empirical foundation. So the US economy stands as a shining reminder of everything that American innovation policy has achieved. And intellectual property rights and patents are the important cornerstones of those achievements. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to addressing your questions. Yeah, happy to take questions. Vince, please raise your hand, and the microphone will be brought to you. Yes, a couple of questions. Uh, one, to what extent is China the lead country in terms of uh, violating some patent rights? 
And two, has there been any special look at drug companies who, and this has been in the news lately, who have uh, taken patents and, and just used them to increase their prices to the point where uh, it's almost unaffordable for people who need the particular drug? So, so taking your first question, there has been uh, um, uh, good research. Other parts of the, the government uh, have looked at uh, IP law violations in China, and it, it has been a problem. But we see it in other emerging countries as well. We see it in India and you know, other, other parts of Asia. And one, one of the challenges that I've had to address is there's outright piracy, right, where someone says, I'm just going to copy this movie or I'm going to copy those shoes or, or something like that. But the problem that I've really had to address as an antitrust enforcer is where their antitrust laws are being interpreted to say, well, we want more competition. You talk about competition, competition is a good thing. And the way we get more competition is we get more competitors. And the way we get more competitors is that competitor has invented something really valuable. So that competitor must share it with everyone else in the market. And then there's you know, so that, and then they say, and we also have an unfair pricing part of our law. So it has to be at a price that we, you may perhaps a state-owned enterprise, think is the fair price. So that's how antitrust law is being distorted to, in effect, allow the misappropriation of U.S. intellectual property at an unfair rate. Now, your question about patents and in pharmaceuticals, that's an issue the FTC has paid a lot of attention to because I talked a lot about the importance of innovation and strong patent rights. And that has been shown to be very strong, uh, a very strong correlation in the pharmaceutical industry in particular. So a lot of the research has shown that, in particular, strong IP rights has led to a lot of innovation in pharmaceuticals. But one of the challenges that we've seen and tried to address uh, is that a company, uh, you know, you get your patent for you know, about 20 years, uh, but you don't get to extend it beyond that through basically misusing the regulatory process or entering an agreement with your competitor not to enter the market. So that's where the FTC has tried to focus that. So next month on November 8th, um, I have announced I'm doing a workshop at the Federal Trade Commission and uh, the Food and Drug Administration is going to be part of it that's looking at this issue. We've got a lot of drugs that are no longer protected by patents, but we haven't seen generic drugs enter the market yet. And to say, well, what is the problem there? Is it a regulatory hurdle? Is it an anti-competitive problem? How can we in the government use our tools not to devalue IP rights, but to say, well, you know, you already got the full measure of your IP. Uh, how come someone else isn't coming in and, and using it freely? Uh, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Okay. Um, in the IP rights, um, uh, free market uh, determines the price. With the IP rights, the price is very difficult to determine, especially at the initial stages. And um, also there are some discoveries, innovation in pharmaceuticals, where, let's say, discovery for cancer, and um, the country or the nations that require this particular uh, remedy from, let's say, Pfizer is very, very expensive. How is the price of the drug is determined given the dilemma of the cancer patients? Thank you. So uh, the question about the inventor, right, of a very uh, valuable technology, whether it's in pharmaceuticals or it's in some, you know, other technology, the idea that they are able to get a high price for that because it's uh, a product a lot of people want is a, a fundamental part of our IP rights system. So the Supreme Court has talked about this, that you need to allow monopoly profits to occur to address, to attract uh, uh, investment and in, in innovation in an area. I think some of the, the problems occur, though, when you have either an anti-competitive situation going on, or as I said, where someone has entered into some sort of anti-competitive agreement to preserve their monopoly beyond the time period that it was granted under, uh, you know, under our patent laws. 
uh, that, that's one of the challenges. And also regulatory problems. One of, one of the issues I've tried to focus on uh, in my tenure is the abuse of government process. So as we have more rules and as we have more government, we have more opportunities for competitors to use the process itself to keep out new forms of competition. Uh, so one of the first things that I did as the acting chair was I founded an economic liberty task force to focus on the abuse of government process to stifle competition. And where a uh, competitor, we talked about, some of the speakers talked about regulatory capture this morning. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, something we, we do see occur. So the question I think uh, that, that, your, um, uh, that your concern addresses is what do we do, you know, you're, 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 you should get the reward for your invention, but you shouldn't get more than that reward, or you shouldn't do it through being able to divide up the market with your competitor. Uh-oh, this is, this is my economics professor, Ken Elzinga, so I'm, I, better, I better be able to answer this question. Yeah, no, so. <laughs> I, it, first of all, thank you for your remarks. It's refreshing to see a government official defend private property rights. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, So my question, Maureen, is this. As you know, American antitrust law has wisely and historically tried to stay away from direct price regulation. And part of what you're saying is that when it comes to antitrust authorities overseas, that they're using forms of price regulation to try and capture private property rights from American innovative firms. What I didn't understand is what the Federal Trade Commission or the DOJ, if you're working with the antitrust division, can do to try and thwart antitrust authorities who are trying to use that strategy against American firms. That is, what, is it a negotiating matter? Is it a litigation matter? What tools do you have in your arsenal to try and stop that? So that's an, 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 excellent, an excellent question. What can, we, what can we do about it? Right? We've identified this problem. What, what can we at the FTC and the Department of Justice do about it? So there are several ways we try to address this. One is by putting forth what the right goal should be. Right? So to say, here are international best practices. We engage with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. We engage with uh, other world um, antitrust bodies to say, Here, here's the right goal, here's what we should be going towards. And then being willing to point out when other countries are uh, deviating from that, to file comments, to raise concerns, to give speeches. So I've gone to China uh, 10 times as a commissioner, so in the last five years. And I went, uh, my first visit there in 2013, I was the first US antitrust official there, uh, at least in the last you know, eight, years or so, to go and say, here is where you're off base. People often go and say a lot of platitudes, cooperation, you know, globalism, that's all nice. But we also need to engage and say, here is where you are deviating from what antitrust is really supposed to be about. I, I think one of the other things um, is to s explain to them why it's not in their interest. So a lot of the... Um, a lot of the empirical work that I've done is to show this strong correlation between protecting IP rights and having an innovative economy. And as, for example, China or other parts of the world want to move away from a copying economy to a more uh, inventive economy, respecting IP rights will be in their own interest. So that's another thing that we need to explain to them. It's very easy to go and say, you're doing X and here's why it's not in the US interest. But it's a lot more persuasive to go to them and say, you're doing X, and here's why it's not in your interest. So those are some of the, the tools. There are also trade remedies, but that is done not really through the Federal Trade Commission, but through um, the trade, you know, USTR and, th and things like that, if it gets to an extreme level. OK, as an economist, I'm kind of of two minds on patents, because on the one hand, patents encourage innovation. That's cool. On the other hand, patents create monopolies. I hate that. So one interesting kind of remedy that I've heard about is the idea of a patent buyout, where if the government recognizes there's a really valuable patent that some firm holds, and it could be beneficial for other firms to get a hold of that technology, the government could basically come in, give that firm the capitalized value, and then put the uh, innovation or the technology into the public domain for all to use. 
So we still have the incentive effect of patents, and then we would limit, tend to reduce the monopoly effect. I just like to hear your comments on that idea. I think that view has a lot more confidence in the ability of the government to second guess the free market than I would feel comfortable in. Uh, and, and I think it also mixes up this idea that monopolies are, are bad. Uh, you know, a monopoly that isn't achieved through superior innovation and through, uh, you know, giving a better product to customers, you know, that, that, you know, that's not great. But a monopoly that's achieved through doing a better job and giving people what they want um, is, is really the reward for that, for that innovation. So I think that um, view mixes up static and dynamic competition. Right, so you're saying, oh, it's my explanation of, you know, oh, there are 10 competitors today and everyone has to share for that product. But who's going to go and invest to create the next best product, the next product that's going to revolutionize uh, the industry if they have to share it with, with everybody? That, I think when you look at it in that way, you realize how you're, you're undermining incentives to create. And so going back to pharmaceuticals, uh, there is not a whole lot of pharmaceutical innovation occurring around the world. It's really occurring in the U.S. where a company that invents that new blockbuster drug that makes us all better off uh, can reap the rewards for that. We have time for one more question. Uh, yes, uh, this relates to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which um, of course became a great political football. Um, it was kicked around. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, was succumbed in the last election and so forth. But, but part of the TPP was designed to um, uh, stabilize or strengthen intellectual property rights, um, to, which would have been uh, apparently greatly to the benefit of American firms. Uh, at, at least that's what I've heard. Now, you're, uh, you would know more about this than, uh, than, than what I've heard. Um, so um, uh, how important or, or, or how problematic has the failure of the TPP to move forward uh, been for enforcing American intellectual property rights internationally, and what can be done about that? So I'm not a, an international trade expert, so I'm a, an antitrust uh, expert. But I do think one of the challenges is where you know, we really need to be alert, right? So you might say you have a uh, an agreement that prevents piracy, right? So piracy, that's not like, you know, just outright copying, not, not permitted. But what are the other regulatory or, or legal tools that can be used to achieve the same goal without calling it piracy? And so that's really where I focus my attention on this um, reinterpretation of what antitrust law is supposed to be about to achieve the bad ends that were prohibited in things like TPP. And we have seen this um, problem occurring throughout um, you know, Asia, India, you know, some other parts of the developing world where antitrust now is being morphed into this tool to allow for sharing at a government determined price, not a free market price for, uh, for the t important technology. Okay. Thank you.